Hey you guys, welcome to Bones Collector and we're going to continue on our series of top 100 games. I'm super excited about the games that I'm going to be speaking this time. And I want to say I hope all of you had a safe and wonderful Thanksgiving. I hope you're able to do that. And I hope that for the Christmas holiday that we all are safe also during that time. Welcome to Bones Collector. It's commercial free and that's always a good thing. So let's start with game number 30, and that is Santa Maria. I love this game, you guys. Santa Maria by Christian Otsby and Eilif Svensson. And I tell you, as soon as I played this game the first time, I was in love with it. And that's the back of the box. You have a player board, that's your colony, and, and you're going to produce resources in order to build up that colony. You're going to go along on some tech tracks, a religious track, I think, and a conquistador track. And I'll show you what's what's in the box here. But yeah, that this game came out, I believe, in 2017. And, and it's for one to four players, so there's a solo mode. 12 and up, 45 to 90 minutes. And Lori and I play this in about 45 minutes to an hour. So I really, really like this game. The first time I played it, I, I was in love with it. And I haven't changed my mind by a port of games. So yeah, let's see what's in here. There's the rule book. There's an error in the printing on, on, on the tiles. It's something to do with the required resources in order to acquire that tile. So you might want to watch for that when you play this game. But that's no big deal. You just have to know it's there. And a nice big print in the rule book. And look at that. There are eight pages in this rule book. And I like a nice small rule book like that. You get a reference sheet here about the tiles. And a little bit of information about the conquistadors of the New World. Missionary scholars and bishops. That's pretty cool. I always like when that kind of stuff is included in games and where the uh, game designer goes the extra mile to tell you a little bit about the subject matter. I enjoy that. My cheater notes. Man. And there's lots of dice in this game because it is a dice drafting game. Some of the dice you'll draft, some of the dice you'll acquire that only you can use on your player board, so that's pretty cool. These are gold tiles that go at the top of the board. End game gold tiles that you'll try to resolve. And the winner of this game wins on happiness. You have all these little happiness faces with different values. They're just victory points, but it's kind of cool that they made them little happy faces. I enjoy that. So let's see, player markers and dice. Don't use with two players. Let's see, resources, we've got bunch of resources in this bag. They're all wooden resources. So yeah, you get a whole bag of wooden resource tokens. You get grain, gems, sugar, and gold, and wood. So those are pretty cool. That's a nice little quality component. I, the word was escaping me for some reason. And then in this game you're going to be laying tiles, and this is a bunch of the tiles. They're two different shapes. They're either three or there's a two. A two space and three space and you're going to be laying those on your player board and I'll show you what that's about. These are town hall tiles. It's just a tile that you start with at the beginning of your board. Okay and you're going to be doing some shipping. There's a bag of money here. Part of the game is trying to complete these shipment tiles as the game goes on. Road tiles, that's just a few of those. And this is a player board that you're going to be using. And it has a place for you to store your resources. There's a limit to how many you can have. So that makes the game a little more difficult because you, obviously you, you might be able to trigger more resources than you can store. So you need to spend those to make room for them. But you're gonna be laying your tiles on this board and triggering them with the die values that are on there whether it's the white dice or the dice you'll be drafting, and the blue dice are dice that you acquire yourself, and you have to use them over here on the left-hand side of your board so that you're going to be triggering columns and rows. You'll be triggering the rows with the blue dice, the columns with the white dice. But when you're laying the tiles on here, of course there's a certain way you're gonna to have to do that in order to get the most out of the dice that you're going to be using. So yeah, that's your player board, and that's pretty cool. Yeah. And then this is the main board, and I told you about the Conquistador track. That's this one here. This is a religion track where you're going to use monks to move along here. And then once you pass certain points, and you can see these blue values, 1, 2, and 3, when you pass those, you get another die. When you hit here, you get one blue die, two blue die, three blue dice. And 
as you go along that track, you will reap these benefits up here. You have to place one of your monks up here on one of these squares, I think is the way it goes. So that's pretty cool. And then your shipping tiles go over here, and you're building that up. You're, you're, you're acquiring those shipping tiles as a set collection thing, so that's pretty cool too. Yeah, and that's Santa Maria. And there's a lot to think about in this game. It's a medium to medium heavy complexity game. And there's a, so much to think about that I, I, I wouldn't call it easy. So that's why I say medium to medium heavy. And the next couple of games fall into this category of Santa Maria, as far as complexity is concerned. And I really, really love this game. I, every time I play it, I just really love it. And I watched Broken Meeple, Luke Hector, a guy I really love, I really love Luke. And he was talking about may, possibly getting rid of this. I want to tell you, Luke, that's a mistake because when you get to be my age, you're going to want games that are small and play big. And that's what Santa Maria does. It's a small game, doesn't take up much sp table space, but man, does it play big. And that is the beauty of this game. Yeah, Santa Maria, number 30, right? Yeah. Okay, then we're going to move on to number 29. And that is a game that most people in gaming are familiar with, Trajan by Stefan Feld. And a lot of people feel that Trajan is Stefan Feld's best game. That just lets you know how good it is. It's not my favorite game by Stefan Fell. It is excellent though, and I enjoy playing it. It is a game that has a Moncala mechanism in it. And let's see, right there is your Moncala. Each player will have a Moncala board, and everything on that board, every place on that Moncala has a different action that you're gonna take on the board. And that's how this game is played. Yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful game by Stefan. Mm -hmm. I really enjoy his games, oh my gosh. The guy is incredible. My cheater notes. This is the rule book. Yeah, you're going to have little player tokens, little meeples that you're going to be placing on the board. You take seaport actions. You have one of four options when you do the seaport action. And it's one of them is choosing commodity cards that you match up and you get points for on the ships that are going to be on the board. And I'll show you where that's at on the board. Final scoring. Yeah, Lori and I play this in about an hour, and I really, really love doing that because this game will put you through your paces in an hour, and that can be so satisfying. These are your commodity cards, so you get a deck of those. This is a bunch of don't use with two players because we, we play with two, so we separate that stuff out. Those are green and red pieces for the game that we, that we use to play this game. We use green and red. And let's see, you have a lot of tiles that you are going to try to acquire and put them on your Mancala so that you can reap that benefit. And that's what all these are, different point tiles, different functions that they have, demand tiles, extra action tiles, demand tiles, quarter year tiles. Uh, we put those in plastic holders. And there's the ships that you're going to have to try to match up the commodity cards with so that you can get points and these are construction tiles that and I'll show you where they go on the board so this is a bag that you're going to draw bonus tiles out of at random you get a whole bunch of those and then this is the game board this is the game board and this is I'll show you that in a second but these are the player boards and you can see the Moncala that you're going to be using and you'll have little markers that are going to be in these dishes and you pick up the markers out of one dish and drop one off as you go along in each dish and wherever you end up that's the action you're going to take so it takes a lot of planning and I, yeah, I mean I love games that do that you have to think ahead two or three turns and I don't know there's something about games like that that I really enjoy having to think ahead and make a plan for your actions as you take them and that's your Moncala board and then here is the main board and I know Stefan Feld gets a lot of heat or he did in years past about the dryness of his games as far as components and that kind of thing but I like his games for that reason because they don't overproduce it, so it doesn't cost a lot. I think Trajan is still readily available, and I think it's still inexpensive. 
don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure it is. It's one of the best games you'll ever play. And once you get into it and start playing it, it'll fascinate you. And it has player counts here, and that's your timer for the game, or for a round actually, and the game. And then different places on the board that you're going to go and take actions of, depending on where you end up in that Mancala. So yeah, it's a pretty complex game. Again, medium to medium heavy, I would say. But, as I said before about Stefan Feld's games, once you start playing them, it all is kind of an intuitive thing. You go, oh yeah, okay. The light comes on like that when you play his games. The guy is the best at what he does, and I just never have found a board game designer that I think is on his level. But once you start playing this game, the light comes on very quickly. You say, oh, okay, I get it. Yeah, I know what I'm doing now. Yeah, I get it. And this is, this is amazing. Yeah. And that's Trajan. And that's my number 29. Yeah. Check out Trajan if you haven't already. Okay, number 28 is, a, no, this game's a classic also, Twa. It's in, for me, first time I played it, I was in love. And I haven't fallen out of love with it every time Lori and I play it. It just reinforces the fact that I, if I picked a top 10 classic games, this is going to be in it. And that's the back of the box. This is another dice drafting, dice worker placement game. Um, some of the things I love about Twa, first of all, is there's no player board. And I, and I say that quite often because I think sometimes board game designers get obsessed with that type of thing. Be I think you can make a wonderful game just with a game board and, and some components. And Twa does that. You have a main board like I showed you on the back, and that's it. No player board. You're just going to be taking every action on that board. Everything that you do to play this game takes place right on that main board. And I really love that about this game. And I have other games that do that. But I really appreciate when games are like that. And it just goes to show you, you don't have to have a large sprawled out game to make you think hard. This one will put you through those paces. And this is by Sebastian Desjardins, Xavier Georges, and Alan Orban. And I have other games by these people. Very good born game designers. This has a page telling you about the event cards on this side and the activity cards on this side. And I think it takes 90 minutes to play this game, even at two. But that's okay, because it plays very smoothly. Take my cheater notes. Uh, the rule book tells you the concept of the game, tells you what's in the box. I always like that. Set up, initial placement. Okay. This game is pretty complex, so we have quite a few notes that help us play it. And you, you guys might try to do that if you have games like Twa. Because of the size of our gaming library, 200 games, Sometimes it's a while before we revisit them. So when we do that, we like to get to playing as quickly as possible. So we type up some notes that tell us a lot of the things that we need to know to play the game and a lot of the things that are often forgotten as far as rules in that particular game. But it helps us play them and set them up and play them very quickly. And that's because we like to go through and play our games as much as possible. So yeah, we want to be up and running as quick as we can. Yeah, so here you go. This is the main board, and this is the quadrants or the uh, sections of the city. You're going to roll a handful of dice, depending on how many people you have in each one of these. Uh, this is military. This is the cathedral, I think. This is money, and depending on how many meeples you have in that area, it determines how many dice you get. You're going to roll them. And the beautiful thing about this game, and the thing I like the most about it, is those dice are you know they're open for everybody. So. If your opponent rolls their dice, puts them in their city there, and you take a look at them and say, oh my gosh, I need one of those dice to go with one of my dice to do this action that I have to do. I have to have that action. You can do that. You can take their dice from them. And you have to pay. Okay, you're going to have to pay to do that. But hey, that's a beautiful thing. Uh, in a two-player game, we have a dummy player, and you can also take his dice. And I love that. Then you have event cards you have to deal with down here, and you have to resolve those first before you do anything else on the board. But man, I tell you, Twa is a beautiful game. There's a deck of event cards and character cards. Deck of character cards, a deck of activity cards. 
a bunch of bag of dice, wonderful, wonderful dice that you're going to roll because those are your workers. And these are your victory point tokens, money, and then each player color, you get a whole bag of meeples and cubes. So yeah, because you're going to be placing cubes up in the cathedral. You're building the cathedral up there. So that is Twa, a game that's going to put you through your paces intellectually. Again, let's see, these first three games I talked about, Santa Maria, Trajan, and Twa are all about in that same complexity level. So yeah, that's Twa. I love this game. Gosh, those three games I just told you about, I'm telling you, those are classics. Classic games that you... Here's why you don't get sick of a game like that. Those last three I told you about is because they are so fresh every time you play them because there's so much going on in your head. It just massages your brain and you enjoy that and it's electrifying to play those games. And so when you revisit them, it's the type of thing you can't memorize what's going to happen in that game. It's going to be different every time you play it. And it's going to be an intellectual workout every time you play it. You never get tired of them. They're different every time you play them. And they're challenging every time you play them. That's all you can ask out of a board game. Okay, game number 27. Finca by Ralph Zerlind and Wolfgang Sankter. And yeah. There's the front of the box. And there's the back of the box. I think Finca is still pretty hard to find. I'm pretty sure they had, you know, the original print run and wasn't very large. And so it was kind of difficult to get your hands on. And then we played it at a convention and we both decided we really want that game. It was very hard to find. But lo and behold, they did a short print run somewhere in Europe, I think. And we were uh, able to search it out on the internet and pick up a copy and I was so glad we did. I love this little game. Now this is a little bit less complex than the other three games I've shown you so far. Here's the rule book. You get a beautiful map for a main board. That's pretty cool. And you're just building Finkas on the board. But you're doing it with this windmill and <laughs> that is so cool. And on the windmill you're going to be moving your farmers I think it is and trying to acquire these Good. I think there's figs, all these fruits, lemon, oranges, grapes, almonds, olives, and figs. So those are the resources that you're going to be acquiring on that windmill. Gosh darn it, that's so much fun. You have to have a donkey cart to deliver those to finish a tile on the board to deliver those resources. And you can only acquire a donkey cart at two places on the windmill. So you have to go around and you have to plan when you're going to get those donkey carts and you can only have so many of them you may end up not being able to take one if they're all out, or I think there's a limit of how many you can have. I can't remember, but there is a little bit of thinking that goes into that part of the game. And then you're going to acquire these tiles off the board and add them up at the end of the game. Person with the most points wins the game. But yeah, nice big print in this rule book. This is uh, another language here in the back. That's that. My cheater notes. And this is the El Razul expansion. Yeah, and that came with this particular edition. Now, the original Finca board was smaller than this one. You know how I am. I like smaller boards, but this isn't too bad. And you can see where you're gonna place all these windmill tiles at random around this windmill and move your farmers around them. And what else we got here? Uh, El Razul expansion. These are our player blue and red that we use. These are your fruit tiles that populate this board here. A whole big bag of fruit resources made out of wood. That's really nice. You get a El Razul standee that you're going to use in the game. Oh wait a minute, here's yellow and green. That's what we use. We use yellow and green in the in the game. And we, you have some tiles in here that give you, I think you get four of them, and they have a special action or special power, and you want to use those when it's most opportunistic to do so. And Finca tiles, so you're trying to build Fincas on the board. Yeah, there's these bag of Finca tiles, and I don't know if you can see that, but it has one, two, three, four, five, and six. If you complete a tile that takes one resource, 
two resources, three resources, four, all the way to six, you take that tile and you get the points for it. And there's several of those in there. So, yeah. Man, there's a lot of fruit. Nine fruit of each. We have these separated for a reason, I'm sure. I think because the two players. But yeah, all that, look at those big bags of wooden fruit tokens that you get. And it's beautiful when you set this game up. Yeah, so that's the board. And as, once you set it up and start playing it, you really begin to see how it works. And it's a, a relatively easy game, but I'm telling you, it's fun. And working that windmill to your advantage is the challenge in this game. And I still enjoy it. I enjoyed it the first time I played it at a convention. Knew I had to seek it out and acquire it, and we did so. And we're still in love with it, and that's Finca. Okay, game number 26 is Alexander Fister's Isle of Sky. It's called From Chieftains to King. Oh, excuse me, Alexander Fister and Andreas Pelican. I'm sorry, Andreas, I didn't mean to leave you out. Published by Mayfair Games. Clemens Franz is the art, as you can tell. It looks just like a Grickler or something like that. And there's the back of the box. And you can see you have a player screen right there. And each person is a clan trying to build up your territory. And in this game, you're going to be acquiring tiles by bidding behind that screen. And that is the... the that's the meat of this game. You get a great big bag of tiles. You're going to build up your territory by tiles that you bid on and try to win that bid and get those tiles from your opponent. You have a whole bag of, or excuse me, I think there's like four different clans. No, five. Five different clans that you can be. Player markers, a big bag of money. Okay, and these are the scoring tiles and you get a whole bunch of them. And I'll show you why that's a big deal on this board this is the main board it's very small as you can see it's two-sided so anyways in this game you have a whole bunch of these scoring tiles but only four of them are going to be in your game and that's why this game has huge variability because one two three four a b c d and then down here on the round tracker it's going to tell you which ones of those are going to score at the end of the round this round here is going to score a and c so whatever tiles are in A and in C in those windows, those are the tiles that are going to score at the end of that round. So you've got to build your village and your territory up to reflect those bonus tiles and the need that they require in order to get those points. And then in the next round, you're going to score B and D. So B and D will score in the next round and so forth. In this one, you score three tiles, D, C, and A in this round. So that's pretty cool. And you can see this coming. So you can see what you're going to have to do. And you have to plan ahead for that while you're building your territory, your village or whatever. And that's really the fun in this game is planning for that and building your village and the bidding mechanism. I'm telling you, this is Alexander Fister's best game. I've played, yes, right? Western Trail and Oh My Goods. And he's, he's a great board game designer. But this one just hits me in the right spot of where we like to play, the right complexity. You can be done in 45 minutes with this game and feel so amazing for having done so. And that's Isle of Sky. It's one of my, it is my favorite game by Alexander Pfister and it is one of my favorite games of all time, obviously, because I can keep getting it out, getting it out, getting it out and playing it, and I enjoy it. Isle of Sky. Okay, game number 25 is a Stefan Feld game called In the Year of the Dragon. In the Year of the Dragon is a game that he had produced by Aaliyah Games. And Aaliyah Games did many of his early work. And let's check it out over there. I'm talking about Castles of Burgundy, Bora Bora, Carpe Diem. Yeah, so they've done a lot of games for Steffenfeld. And let's take a look at the back of the box. Boop. And on the back of the box, you have... These are event tiles that are going to be laid out before you on the board and you can see exactly what is coming. These are bad things that you have to react to, famine, stuff like that. And you have to plan for them as you play this game, as you move along. And that's why I call this the best survival game I've ever played, ever. Because it's so cool that you see the events before they happen. And I think there's nine of them in the game. Uh, there's a bunch of event tiles, but you only use nine. And you can see right up front what you have to do. 
Okay, I can see round one, what, what I have to prepare for. Am I ready? Am I ready for that event to take place? Am I ready in round four for the famine? Am I ready? And so you're planning the first three rounds to make sure you're ready for a famine in round four and, and developing your palace floors and so forth and the characters that you, character tiles that you take are going to help you do that. And yeah, that's pretty cool. Pretty cool stuff. What's this say? Two to five players, 12 and up, 75 to 100 minutes. Lori and I play this in an hour. And a five out of 10 on brain power. <laughs> it's got a brain and a five out of 10. I, this game is not hard. Not hard at all. Let's take a look and see what's in the box. This is the rule book. We made ourselves a note. Object, avoid penalties and bad things. That's a good thing to do in a survival game, yeah. So it has a table of contents, tells you what's in the box. And I think the rule book is a measly 12 pages, not many. And it said five out of 10 in complexity. Yeah, I think this is a medium complexity game. This is the rule book, nice big print. And I'm wrong. This game goes on for 12 rounds, so there's going to be 12 event tiles that you have to deal with. But the beauty of it is you get to see them in advance and do your planning. And I love that about this game. It's, every time I play this game, I'm like, this is the best survival game I've ever played. There's so many survival games out there. I have never found one that gives me the satisfaction as in the Year of the Dragon. Not even close, actually. My cheater notes. Each player color will have a deck of cards that you're going to use to make your character selections. And then you also have a dragon that you're going to place on action tiles, taking turns to do that. Action, they call action cards, or action, they're actually thick tiles that are on the board. There's the person tiles, there's the palace floors that you have to use in your tableau. Another set of player things. There's the event tiles. And I think there's just 12 of them, so you're not going to get a bunch of different ones. But each game, you're going to lay those out differently so the game will be different every time. A few coins, because money's hard to come by in this game. And there's a little bit of expansion that came in the game. This was the 10th anniversary edition. Rice and firework tiles. And privilege tiles. So, okay. That is all there is in this game box other than the board. The board doesn't look like much until you set it up. Here's the main board, and down here are the 12 spaces for the event tiles. And then your character tiles are going to go up here, uh, your scoring track. This is the person track, so it determines player order. Whenever you take a person, you move on that track. So the board, yeah, it's kind of small board, which uh, I, you know, I enjoy that. And then we have a in the year of the dragon player aid that we got off Board Game Geek, that you might want to consider looking that up and uh, using that to help you play the game. Again, the best survival game I've ever played, and I enjoy it immensely every time I play it. And Steppenfell just has a way of designing great board games. Anyways, that's in the year of the dragon, and that was game number 25. This is the second part of this 10 games. I got too tired the other night and had to discontinue, but we're gonna continue on to you. It just happened just like that. So here we go with game number 24. I probably have a different shirt on too. Uh, Chimera Station. Yeah, Chimera Station, published by TMG and designed by Mark Major. I don't know if you've played this Chimera Station game, but man, I tell you what, I was in love with it the first time I played it and kept it and knew it was part of my library for good because it is a worker placement game with a twist, and I really enjoy that. Now, Chimera Station plays two to four, 60 to 90 minutes, 14 and up, but uh, it's not hard, and TMG does some games that really hit Lori and I where we like to play. Uh, very medium complexity game, my cheat notes, my rule book for this game. That's, I, I like to show you the rule book because the printing can be a problem sometimes, but not in this case. And the rule book is very descriptive. It tells you about what all the symbols mean, the modules, how to build the modules, perk cards. Yeah, and on the back, symbols and keywords, it tells you, has a chart for you. So that's always handy when they use the back of the rule book. I really, really like that. So let's go through here and see what we've got in the box. And these will be your player boards. They're kind of the thin cardboard type of stuff, but you've seen those before in games. And they're double-sided. One side has a little more difficulty than the other. 
That's, that really lends itself to replayability. We really like that. So in this game, in this worker placement game, you will be feeding your workers, but there's a cool way to do it. So there's some hamburgers. <laughs> That's our food. And these are the components, as you can see on the box. You're gonna, it has kind of a, a childlike artwork to it, but the game is not childlike at all. I, I think maybe that might have interfered with the popularity of this game or the way people perceived it because it is a very nice complexity game and I don't think it would be really attractive to kids. But you got these little aliens that you're going to build. The components snap into each other and depending on which component you put on your worker it gives you a special function. So uh, the green ones in here, uh, by the way, are food. So if you happen to acquire that green piece, but if you put that on your worker, you no longer have to feed that worker. He automatically feeds himself. So that's pretty cool. So the yellow tentacles allow you to collect additional resources. The green plant component allows you to feed your worker. The brain, purple brains give you extra points. And the red crab component, when you put that on your worker, lets you displace another worker on the worker placement part of the game. So yeah, and then you have workers in each of the player colors. They're plastic like those. You snap those components on top, a bag of money, and let's see what else we got. There was don't use with two players. Perk cards that give that you can acquire that give you special benefits throughout the game. And starting player resource cards. At the beginning of the game, each player will get one of these and it will start you off in the game, give you certain resources that are different from another player to uh, give that game variability thing uh, in this game. And then you have the tiles themselves, which, you, which are modules that you're going to take from the reactor, I believe it's called, and build these and put them on the board. And then that gives you even more worker placement spaces. So that's pretty cool. And there's a whole bunch of them. And let's take a look at the board. I don't want to take too long about this. That's the board. And the game is played in five rounds. You have a tile that goes on here and it moves down that track as you're going throughout the game. This is called the reactor. It's where the module tiles will go. And you come over here this, at this worker placement space to acquire one of those and you'll place it up here on the main board. And whatever you cover up, you collect that resource or benefit. And then over here, some more worker placement spaces. You got the prestige or scoring track that goes around the outside. That's pretty cool. And then the splicing lab where you come over here and splice together your workers. Uh, and then once you go there, you can place them after that any place on the board. So yeah, that's a pretty cool twist on a worker placement game. It's, it's so different that I really, really enjoy it. And I don't get tired of it because building those little monsters is a lot of fun and it's you know it's pretty thought-provoking when you're trying to figure out which components to put because you won't be able to do it all and uh, you, there's so many different ways you can build those workers to give you different benefits you can put brains on all of your workers and and hope that the gathering of the points and bonuses through, with the brain component will win you the game or you can put the food component on your workers so that you don't have to worry about having to feed them at the end of that round. And that's pretty cool too. And so yeah, it's all that decision making that goes on in the game that makes this game different and fun. So yeah, that's Chimera Station. I guarantee you you'll love it. It's my number 24 game by Tasty Minstrel Games. And I have a lot of Tasty Minstrel Games in my library. And this is one of my faves, Chimera Station. All right. Let's move on to number 23. Name is Gold West by J. Alex Kevern. And you saw me talk about J. Alex Kevern in another game called Sentient that's in my top 100, which I really, really love. I like this one better though. And i tell you why in a second. This is my favorite game by J. Alex Kevern. And it takes place in the Old West. It plays two to four players, 12 and up, 45 to 60 minutes. And again, yeah, another TMG game. So that's pretty cool. I like these games that are medium complexity that you can set up and play and have them back in the box in an hour. There's the rule book. Kind of even has an, an Old West feel to the rule book. Nice big print in the rule book. It tells you how to set up Boomtown. I'll show you where that's at in a minute. It tells you 
Okay, in the, in the back of the rule book, each of the investment cards and what they can do. So that's the rule book. And this is kind of a different game because you have a modular board and it comes with these big puzzle pieces that form the square and then in the middle you're going to put these modular pieces and so that game sets up different every time. But let me see if I can show you some of these because there's some things on these pieces that you need to see. And yeah. So there's the upper left hand corner of the board and it has a track on it that's going to have everybody's stage coaches and you're going to pay gold, silver, and copper in order to move along that track. And this tells you on your player board if you it's a set collection type of thing and on your player board at the end of the game depending on how many of these you have it tells you what your point totals are going to be and this is Boomtown and it's set up with different tiles each game so it's different every time you play it and that's for end game scoring so that's pretty cool I love Boomtown and also that's the loot place where it tells you how many points you lose when you loot and this is the upper right hand corner of the board and it has place for investments over here okay so that's the board and again you'll take these pieces and put them in the board and that's where you put your mining tiles and that's a whole bag of these uh, each one of the mining tiles has resources on it that you're going to claim you know uh, this one has two copper and a gold two silver and a gold a green cube a black cube and a silver cube on that one and you need those cubes and those resources to do anything in the game and the wonderful thing about this game is on your player board let's see take the rest of this stuff out and talk about it in a minute and if you watch my videos you've seen me talk about this game on your player board you have a mancala and you're going to mine the resources off that center part of the board and you take those resources that you collect and you have to put them in this track here and you get a different point total you can see for depending on the position that you put those resources so if you put them clear at the bottom you get three points and that sounds like a great idea but you can't always put them there because you want to bring them out quicker if you put them down here it's going to be three turns before you can get them out of this mancala because every time you take your turn you're going to pick a group of the resources in one of these sections and you move them up this uh, mancala and drop one off in every bin on your way up and then what you have left over outside the mancala is what you get to spend and you have to build on every turn this game and that creates the tension because if you don't build you have to loot if you loot it costs you points and if you loot more than once maybe twice you're not going to do very well in this game so you have to plan very carefully to make sure that you build without looting you can loot maybe one time because that costs you one point i showed you on the board but more than that you start to go backwards in this game so you want to make sure that you're planning that mancala mechanism precisely so that you can build on every turn you have to have a green cube and a black cube to, to build and so forth and then here's the set collection part I showed you where you collect the mining tiles. When you collect those mining tiles, you take the resources and then you will flip it over and put it on this board. And it depends on, on how far you get down this track, how many points you get at the end of the game. But man, that is really cool. And the game ends after someone has all their tents off their player board. So you have these, uh, and I'll show you those this right now. Yeah, each player color, one, two, three, four. Okay, so it's a four player game. And each player has stagecoaches and settlements that come in their color that, you, that you're going to place on the board. And then these are the resources. They're hex tokens. is all the wooden hex tokens for copper, silver, and gold. We have bonus tiles, investment bonus tiles that go on the board where the stagecoaches are. That track you move along. And then these are the investment cards that are, you put, the, I forget how many of them you use. You don't use all of them in a game, but you put them at the top of the board and people can decide, okay, I'm going to spend, in this case, two silver, two copper, and take this investment card and it says add any two resources to your supply track and it's worth seven points. So those are the type of things the investment cards are. And then there's the black and green cubes and those are the building cubes. Again, you have to build every turn and 
don't use. <laughs> and then uh, this is the Boomtown offices that you will set up in that empty square in the bottom left hand part of the board and they set sets up different in every game and you place your markers down there in Boomtown at the end of the game according to where you have your markers you get to score those points in this game so yeah that is Gold West oh my gosh I can't say enough about this game it's one of my favorite games to play with Lori she got this for me for Father's Day and I loved this game from the moment I first played it and I lost playing this game eight times in a row before I finally won. Eight times in a row she beat me because she's better at doing that Moncala than I am. And so I'm getting a little better because I finally won a game and I was really, really ecstatic about that. So yeah, we play this every year on Father's Day just because that's when she got it for me. But uh, I really, really love Gold West by J. Alex Kevin. And again, obviously I love it. It's my number 23 game of all time. And you will love it too if you give it a chance and give it give it a play. And I wanted to mention that as when I'm filming this up at Cool Stuff, right now this game is on sale for $24 or $25, bucks, $24.99, something like that. It's only on for Monday and Tuesday, so we're going to try and get this video out. $24.99. It's a good game, man. I mean, this is a great game, and I love it. It'll always be in my library because, it's, again, it's a meeting complexity game. Oh my gosh, there's so much, but there's so much going on on this little board. I, I just, I'm fascinated by that. And the theme comes through strong with the stage coaches. You have little wooden miners that keep track of your score around the outside of the board. The wooden tents and settlements you place on the board. Everything about this game is amazing. It's J. Alex Cavern's Gold West. Number 22, oh my gosh. I don't know if I can say anything about this game. It hasn't already been said. Pandemic by Matt Laycock. And I have two other Pandemic games in my library. Fall of Rome and Pandemic Reign of Cthulhu, which we play during October. And I love both of those games. Pandemic Iberia is also a very good version of Pandemic. But it's so similar to the original Pandemic that we decided to move that one on and we kept the other two, Fall of Rome and Reign of Cthulhu, and this one, of course, the original. And the reason why I love this game so much, and this should be in every gamer's library, I mean, anybody can play this game. It's a cooperative adventure, and because of its versatility, it's just so attractive as an introductory game to new gamers. Because when you have somebody that doesn't play board games, and I've done this with a lot of relatives and friends, if I play a game, I drag this one out if they're not gamers, because in a cooperative board game like this, you can help them take their turn because you're teammates. Everybody's on the same team. We're, we're trying to beat the game. So you can tell them the things they need to do and give them the choices of what to do on their turn. And they feel comfortable with that. You can help them and it's very inviting and it's still challenging for hardcore gamers. I love this game. This is gaming perfection right here. Pandemic. And I mean, don't take my word for it. I think it's sold to, I don't know, 15 million. I don't know how many millions of copies. But this game is super popular for a reason, because it's so inviting to so many different types of gamers. So yeah, we can take a look in the box real quick. I don't think that'll stand up, no. My notes, the rule book, and again, Pandemic is such a, yeah, not a lot of rules in this. Look at that, that was it. That was that, six pages? Eight page rule book, and big print, very easy to understand this game, and that was what makes it so wonderful. You get a world map, you're trying to stop the spread of disease. <laughs> wow, you know, that, yeah, that's the world map, and because we're in a pandemic, and this is a pandemic game, it really falls into line with today's world and culture, doesn't it? So yeah, it's a, a wonderful, wonderful game to get out to play, not only again for hardcore gamers, but for people just learning gaming. And I've played this with, again, relatives that don't game, and they've loved it and come away with a great feeling about board gaming. And isn't that what it's all about? It's just to be more inviting to everyone. And there's a game out there for everyone, they just haven't played it yet. But yeah, Pandemic is a card driven game. You have decks of cards with cities and couple of different decks of cards. There's not a lot to it. And then disease cubes for the different diseases, different colored cubes. And 
your little markers that come with you, with it, depending on the character that you're going to play. The disease tubes that go on the board, once you uh, eradicate the diseases, those move in position. And then we did a little thing, we got little characters, little meeples that are painted up to match each character on the character cards, which just gives us a little bit more fun for the game, because we play this game a lot. You can probably find this very inexpensively and on sale at a, your local game store, but this is a game that must be in everybody's library because, again, I, I, I can't say enough about what it means when you're dealing with a new gamer and you want them to like board gaming. This is the one to get out right here, folks. And that's what I do. Pandemic by Matt Laycock. Okay, number 21 is Viticulture by Stonemeyer Games. Jamie Stegmeyer was one of the designers, Alan Stone and Morta Monred Pedersen. So, yeah, Viticulture is about winemaking. I hope you've played this game because it is wonderful. I really enjoy it, and it's my, not my favorite game from Stonemeyer Games, but it is my favorite game from Jamie Stegmeyer. And this is the back of the box. You're going to simply be a family trying to run an orchard, grape orchards, and making wine. And this is the Essential Edition, and I believe it came out originally in a different format and they upgraded it a little bit and called this the Essential Edition. It's the one that I have and we did have the Tuscany Expansion and played that and liked it but we eventually sold the Tuscany Expansion and we just kept the Viticulture Essential Box. The board is smaller and we enjoy that. Let's take a look inside the box. Real quick, it's a worker placement game also. And there's a rule book. And again, I, I, I always tell you if the rule book is good or bad, and this rule book is good. Yeah, that's a very good rule book. Yeah, and this card is a Viticulture Rules Summary and Reference card that comes with it. And that's always cool when you have a little helper like that. Mama Papa cards that you get at the beginning of the game. Field cards, but those are the cards that are going to go for on your vineyards. Yeah. This is a, it, it, you can play this solo, so there's a solo deck of cards. Uh, let's see, and these are the player boards. So I guess six player boards, and this is what they look like. They're two-sided. That's pretty cool. And this is your wine cellar that you're going to be eventually mixing some wines and getting your wine values upgraded as far as you can on this part of the board over here and that's pretty cool because you want to sell them for as much as you can in this game and then oh my gosh I got meeples everywhere in this game this is the main board and it's double sided and the game ends when somebody gets 20 victory points. And it's a worker placement game, and these are just different spots where you can place your workers. It's played in seasons. After four seasons, that's a year, end of a round. Each season is a phase. After four phases, the round ends, and you do something to do your scoring and upgrading of your wines and so forth. You have places for your cards up here, your visitors, and that's one way you can score points in this game. So. Yeah, in the Tuscany expansion, the board was about that much wider, and we just didn't like that. I like the smaller board, and the game is fantastic just the way it is. It doesn't really need a Tuscany expansion, but it's fine. I mean, I'm not going to say the expansion wasn't good. It was good. If, if you're like us, you're only playing two, three players, you just don't really need that. It makes the game longer for starters, and, and I don't care for that either. So you get a bunch of cards. A lot of cards that are your visitor cards that you're going to be satisfying visitors with, selling wines to, and so forth. And big bag of money. First player marker and your temporary workers, because you can get a temporary worker in this game. Last tokens to mark your wine wines on your player board that I showed you. They go on here. So depending on what color of wine you, you are growing in your fields, you get to put a token 
on the board. So you get a bunch of cards. There's vine cards and wine cards and visitor cards that you can acquire in different worker spaces on the board. And you have workers in every one of your player colors, all six player colors. And the cool thing about this game is it has a grande worker because when you're placing your workers, you can't place them on an occupied space. There's only certain spaces you can go to. And then, but your grande worker can you can put that on an occupied space. So you kind of kind of save him in reserve and, and make a tough decision as to where you want to use that grande worker. And that must makes this game interesting. And it's an excellent game by Jamie Stegmeyer and, and the other fellows that uh, designed this with him. I love this game. Every, first time I played it, I, I thought it was amazing and I haven't changed my opinion on it. Now I did have uh, Vita Lacerda's Vinos Deluxe for a while and I liked that game too. That was a very good wine making game also. I love this theme by the way if you haven't noticed. But I really really enjoyed that game also. But it was a little more invo involved I guess than this one. And the box was bigger. <laughs> so you know how I am about that. So yeah the box was bigger and I decided you know what I'm going to keep Viticulture and I sold, moved on uh, Vinos Deluxe. Which again folks that's a great game. If you have that game that's fine. I loved playing it. It was wonderful. I just, uh, for Lori and I, for just playing two players, this was a lot better fit for us. And I really, really enjoy it. And yeah, so this is a wonderful game about winemaking. It's very, very fun to play. It's not lengthy in any way, but it's wonderful. And that is Viticulture, the Essential Edition. A wonderful heavy-duty box. It's kind of a small box, so I enjoy that. You know, it's... Uh, that uh, you don't want, you want to have a lot of I want to have a lot of games so I don't want to have great big boxes but that's Viticulture by Stonemeyer Games and I love it and that is game number 21 and that is it for this video and I know you're asking yourself well what are you playing right now Bones Collector well here, <laughs> here's what I'm playing right now <laughs> and it's, it's it's everything that I don't like. <laughs> You know, here's the deal. I'm playing Dwellings of Elderville right now. Uh, we're going to go back over and start it right now. But it is a theme that's, oh, you know, I don't really care for this kind of theme. I ordered this off Kickstarter because I thought it would be a nice hot game to get out and do a video on. But lo and behold, the way they shipped it out, the United States got theirs last. And I was even last in the United States. So there's videos all over YouTube about Dwellings of Eldervale. And uh, Luke Laurie is the name of this board game designer. And I, we are in love with Manhattan Project Energy Empire. He did that game also. And it has a similar mechanic in it. But I'll let you know how it turns out in a future video to see if, uh, if I really like it. But the box is huge. And yeah, I don't know. It's going to have to be incredible for me to keep it. But uh, yeah, that's Dwellings of Elder. That's what we're playing. Eldervale, that's what we're playing right now. And I also played another game called Fossilus that we got off Kickstarter. And I have to tell you, I've played that game twice now, Fossilus, and I like it. I was pleasantly surprised about this game. And I will talk about it in a future video, but I do like it. And that's it. That's it for today. And I love all of you guys. I hope you have a wonderful Christmas. We'll try and get more videos out for Christmas. We'll see. But the next 20 games, the top 20 games in our series are going to be presented by myself and my wife Lori because she wants to tell you what her 20 games are. And that was suggested by one of you wonderful people that are uh, one of my wonderful subscribers, which I have like 584 now, which I, I, I love. It's pleasant to speak to you about board gaming, about our passion for board games, because uh, it's something that we like to do to keep our minds fresh. Uh, being older folks, we enjoy putting our mind through some paces and working out our brains to keep our minds young, even if our bodies are, are starting to go south. So yeah, be safe. Have a wonderful holiday season if we don't talk to you soon. And I love every one of you. Keep on board gaming. It's the best hobby on the planet. And we'll see you soon. Make sure you like. Make sure you like for me, please. Like, 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 because that moves our videos up. And subscribe. And I'll see you next time on The Bones Collector. Bye-bye.